Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And guys, it is an absolute treat to be here again today. We have with us Stephen Kotler. Stephen, how are you, brother? Every time you do that, you scare the shit out of me. <laughs> well, hey, we were just talking about patent recognition. It's a blessing to be someone that can disrupt your patents. So glad to be one of those people. <laughs> Yeah, hey guys, buddy, you're of service. <laughs> for those tuning in to Stephen for the first time, give me a moment. Um, we've had him on here before, just before the release of his last book, The Last Tangle in Cyberspace, which was an incredible read, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. But Stephen is an award-winning journalist and the foremost expert in the science of ultimate human performance, right? A passion for this he developed after rising victorious from an epic battle with Lyme disease. He's an amateur extreme athlete who's broken over 80 bones. <laughs> His work transcends idol philosophy and he has the breathless quality of a man writing from the front lines of what he's researching and what he's exploring. I love his work. His work, words and insights race off the page and reveal that he has a mind that continuously, perpetually seems to be operating in a higher gear. With Peter Diamandis, together they've bound together to work in a quest to future-proof mankind. That leads into some of the conversation we're going to have today. His ideology has caused global thinkers to stop and take note. Former Bill, President Bill Clinton called his book Bold, The Future is Better Than You Think, A Visionary Roadmap for Change. He's a deeply passionate man who continues to thoughtfully explore a wide range of topics, such a wide range of topics. He's also written a book called A Small, Fuzz, uh, Small Fairy Prayer, <laughs> Dog Rescue and the Meaning of the Life, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. And his most recent work, which I'm really excited to dive in today, is The Future is Faster Than You Think, which gives us the seemingly impossible, right? 360 degree look at how converging exponentials are reshaping our world tomorrow. Overall, his work's been translated into 40 languages, appeared in 80 publications worldwide, including New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Forbes, Wired, Time. And if that wasn't already enough, just because he didn't have any more <laughs> things to do, he also founded the Flow Research, a research Collective, dedicated to understanding and developing the science of optimized human performance. Stephen, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's so good to have you here. It's good to be with you. <laughs> hey, I want to tune in. So the future is faster than you think. Um, the book is on its way. You met. It's written by yourself and Peter. Um, for us, tune, for those tuning into Peter Diamandis and yourself for the first time in the collaboration, you've written a few books. Um, it was first Bold and then Abundance. And is this forming a bit of a trilogy? Like, what's going on? What's the story being told through? Yeah, this? it's so uh, we think of it as a trilogy. We, we're calling it. Uh, and after selling it on Amazon, I believe, as a trilogy called the Exponential, awesome. yeah, the Exponential Mindset Trilogy. Right. And, you know, the, so the, the ideas definitely build on each other, right? Abundance, mm -hmm. where we started, was about how individuals are harnessing exponential technology to solve grand global problems. Yep. Bold, right? The follow-up was so many people read the first book and went, oh, my God, that's so cool. I want to start a company and, and help save the world and make billions of dollars. How do you do it? And bold was the how-to, right? It's everything we've learned, you know, around exponential companies. And then the future is faster than you think is what happens when these formerly independent lines of exponential technology, AI or robotics or biotech or genomics, take your pick, start converging and intersecting. And what we get is a, a whole is, you know, much greater than the sum of parts effect. So we get massive amounts of technological acceleration in really, you know, short time frames. Or Ray Kurzweil, who did, ran the math on it, has, has said we're going to experience 100 years worth of technological change over the next decade. So, you know, go back 1920, fast forward to now and put that in the next 10 years. And, you know, proof positive is, is what's going on, right? The, what's going on in the world right now is the future is faster than we thought, too. Right? Yeah. We thought it was going to take 10 years to reinvent healthcare and we lay, lay out that map and we're seeing that map play out in you know in six weeks time it's crazy yeah insane insane so the book can almost be called convergence um there's such a deep theme of that running through the book um what inspired you to write this book now it was the converging exponentials and it was the fact that the scale of disruption and the scale of opportunity off, you know, off that disruption is increasing in orders of magnitude, right? And when we looked at abundance and bold and talked about individual exponentials, they disrupt services and markets, mm -hmm. sometimes markets. When you get converging exponentials, they disrupt markets, institutions, and all the systems that support them. 
in really dramatic, dramatic ways. And this is happening everywhere. So it, you know, it means there's going to be more opportunity mm -hmm. over the next decade than ever before, but there's also going to be more disruption over the next decade than ever before. And the book, you know, is both hugely optimistic and, you know, also a way of preparing people, future proofing as, as you put it, you know, people about against the next 10 years we go and, and you know, as, we go industry at by industry, right? That's what the book is. It's a blueprint. It looks at the 11 biggest industries in the world and tracks them over the next 10 years. Here are the convergences. Here are the disruptions. Here's what's coming technologically. Here are the new business models. Here are the new market opportunities. Here's what's going to completely disappear. Stephen, I, I, I just have to go there. Like, how does one or two, <laughs> yourself and Peter, sit there and go across such a broad data, like such a broad range of information, first of all, data looking at all the different things that are converging um, at the moment. Um, and I probably should have asked you what converging technologies are for those that are tuning in, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, but in terms of how do you stay across so much information in terms of all the things that are converging, right? But then also, like the, the impact that they're going to have on all the markets. It's an incredible book. I, you know, it's, it's interesting um, and not, it's not easy and, you know, clearly it's not just us it's also like there's an enormous team of, of brilliant minds at Singularity University that mm -hmm. Peter is tapping on a regular basis. He's got Abundance 360, another example of that, that he's tapping on a regular basis. The Flow Research Collective is actively, you know, working, at, you know, in four or five of these kind of converging technologies right now, right at the cutting edge of it. So, so that's going on, you know, on, on that end. And Peter, you know, has been doing this forever. He's founded 22 companies. I've been covering technology and specifically cutting edge technology as a journalist, as an author, and as a writer for 30 years. That's a, that's a, that's a lifetime's worth of connection and so the, the good news about it is and this is not to say we're not surprised I'm, I'm surprised all the time but i have an understanding of the scope of the field you know what i mean like quantum computing is finally here but the first time i was writing about it was in 1990 whatever when david deutsch published a book on it you know what i mean and i think i wrote something for wired on it um so it's, you know, it's cutting edge that took 30 years to get here. 3D printing is a 30 or 40 year old technology at this point that I've been paying attention to for a very long. So, it, you know, it, the, the good news is I've been watching for a very long time. That's the, I think that's the only way to, to do it. You actually have to have mm. spent a lifetime paying attention to these things. Steeping in um, that tea of information, knowledge, patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so... Uh, you touched on something in terms of there's always a lag between where we, where we are and when we're going to. Um, you talked about in there's six Ds that are referenced in that process of something of, like evolving in the future is fast than you think. We talk about digitalization, deception, disruption, demonetization, dematerialization, and democratization. Can you tell us a little bit about what actually goes on in the life cycle of, you know, an, a, a convergence or, a, or an, uh, like a technological kind of journey? Okay, so let's 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 frame up what. Uh, let's put some context around what you're talking about. And let's back up to the beginning, I think. An exponential technology is yeah. any technology that doubles on a regular basis, right? And computers are the clear example. Every 18 months, thanks to Moore's law, your computers get twice as fast because the number of integrated circuits that can fit on a computer chip doubles. So your computers get twice as fast, the cost stays the same. It's a price mm -hmm. performance curve. That is a doubling a virus spreading across the globe is a doubling and things get, when you're dealing with exponentials, they get big really fast, right? If you're just starting at, at zero, 10 doublings gets you to a thousand, 20 gets a million, 30 gets you to a billion, right? That's a, that's a, then, and we're, that's what we're seeing now with a virus growing. So Ray Kurzweil figured out that once the technology becomes digital, meaning once you could program in the ones and zeros of computer code, jumps to the back of Moore's law and starts accelerating exponentially. So all the technologies we're talking about, AI, robotics, nanotechnology, biotechnology, sensors, networks, computing, et cetera, they're all accelerating exponentially. And they're now starting to converge as you've been talking about. So converging exponential is what happens when AI meets robotics. What happens, you know, and, and the, the example we like to give, it's where the book opens and maybe 
let's do this for 10 seconds because it's it makes sense is we open with the story of flying cars and flying cars are here yeah. they're real there are a hundred different car companies in the flying car game every major car manufacturer every major aerospace manufacturer is doing it bell helicopter recently changed their name to bell the future is flying cars uh toyota just put 400 million dollars into joby aviation three weeks ago this is exploding uber wants flying car aerial taxi demonstration projects up and running in la dubai and dallas by 2023 they want to be in operation 2024 2025 and flying cars are like this ultimate sci-fi fantasy and yeah. uh, and i you know and, and, and it's interesting because i i've been involved in it for a very long time a good friend of mine desher Mulnar, invented the world's first flying helicopter 15 years ago and mm -hmm. it's like it's a kit thing that like but it's a flying helicopter and i you know i test flights and you can look it up on the internet and see it and it's amazing and that was sort of like the very early hobbyist days right i saw that I, he walked into my house with the blueprints i think and i was living in la it must have been 2005 or something and you know he's on his way to las vegas and he's like hey i want to stop by to show you these by the way this is the world's first flag helicopter i'm gonna build it <laughs> and you know what i mean and sure enough <laughs> So I've been dragging this for a while and it, it was fantasy for fucking ever. And then suddenly it's reality. And the question is why? So why now? The answer is converging technology. If you want to build a flying car, well, it's an autonomous car. So you need an artificial intelligence to fly it. Mm -hmm. You need solar powered electric in, not solar powered, but like solar power spin off battery power for the whole thing to fly the thing. You mm -hmm. need a, uh, electric motors that have kind of spun out of the drone industry, right? And flying cars are actually robots because they're scaled up drones. You also need material science breakthroughs to make them light enough to fly and yet durable enough for what they have to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are like 11 different converging technologies sitting inside flying cars, 3D printing to print them at scale, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, so the reason they're, it's now is because of converging exponentials and it's converging exponentials that increase the scale of disruption that's why the scale of disruption is growing it's huge and so in there you talked about moore's law but then you also referred to the very next place where you sort of go in the book is is rose's law when it goes into we don't even realize that this is where we were previously working through on just having binary ones and zeros traditional computing and then we move into quantum computing and then like two at this point, it's, like, it's a bit more staggering than even my head could wrap around. Yeah, quantum's hard to wrap your head around. Um, the, the thing that, it, the, quantum computing is AI on steroids. And it's, um, it's not quite ready for prime time. That's, we should be clear on that, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's doing some stuff. Google announced quantum supremacy, which means that quantum machine can now compute, uh, can now solve problems that classical computers cannot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quantum computers can now beat it. AI and supercomputers, but it's a really narrow bandwidth of what they can do it in. And the error rates are still through the roof. And, and so there's a lot of issues. That said, here's the, the, here's the things that are amazing. So Rose's law is Moore's law for quantum. And because quantum isn't binary, it's not ones and zeros, it goes up exponentially. So to, to a 50, they measured in quibits, right? A bit, a quibit, right? So one quantum bit is a quibit and 50 quibits is quantum supremacy and 50 quibits is enough. If 50, we had an iPod that had 50 quibits, it would hold 50 million songs, right? That's an amazing iPod. If you had an 80 quibit iPod, if every atom in the universe could store one bit of information, an 80 quibit quantum computer has more power than all the atoms of the universe. Jesus. That's a That's fairly a amazing iPod. 20, 30 so quibits, it yeah. doubled, right? We're, 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 we're at 50 and we're moving towards 80, right? Like we're going to get wow. there very, very quickly. But here's the fucking, here's the, here's the cool part. This is the coolest part about all of it, I think. All of these technologies and the reasons for the world so world changing is because anybody can play. They have user-friendly interfaces. Anybody can play. You don't have to be an expert anymore. And quantum computing, which is the ultimate expert technology, is the great example. Go to rigetti.com, rigetticomputers.com, or yeah, it's either rigetticomputers.com or rigetti.com. It's 
quantum computer company in Berkeley, California. Actually, I, we tell the story because the coldest place in the universe, <laughs> literally located in Berkeley, California, it's in a pipe in their office where they hold their quantum computer because they have to super cool it to hold equipments in superposition. That's beyond the point. <laughs> Anyways, you can go to their website and download a forest. It's API developers program for their 32 qubit quantum computer that's online and maybe you can use for free. And like 1.4 million programs have been run on this thing, which means like oh. that many people have played on it. Anybody can play and it's all of these technologies. You've got stories about 10 year old kids going into summer camps, learning how to use 3D printers and printing bionic arms, right? That like so good that they can practice their violin with their bionic arm. I mean, like the stories are astounding. So anybody can play and it's happening faster than ever before are two really exciting kind of intersections, right? That's neat. That means we have an explosion in innovation, the world like we've never seen before. And so there's also like a movement in there that you're describing, like you're describing the transparency that's coming up for us. But a lot of these things also seem to be open sourced. And is that just an, uh, a function of the growth somehow? Like, is it or is it is it like a is it fundamental to the growth or is it a symptom of the growth? Do you think that open that open source is that transparency? It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's funny because people people have all kinds of like weird ass fantasies about AI and one country gaining all this power over another with this super right. Like I've heard ever all, all these conspiracy theories and I always sort of shake my head at that one, especially with AI. And the main reason is it's all been open sourced, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Google's TensorFlow is online, right? Mm -hmm. You want to, you want to know Google's super AI. It's free. Uh, like they're all, it's all free online already. Um, we're, uh, at, you know, at the Flow Research Collective, we're working really hard right now to world, build the world's first biophysical based flow detector, something that can monitor your brain and your body and tell you if you're in flow. And then we're going to use this, coupling it with VR to create the world's first uh, accelerate, high flow accelerated learning environments, distributed, <laughs> right? We were building it for worker retraining um, in the face of you know, coming technological unemployment, if that's an issue. Um, so we want to be able to retrain workers really quickly um, and, and flow massively accelerates learning and VR is really good for creating flow. And if you have a biophysical based flow detector, you can then have real time feedback and blah, blah, blah. So it's really, the potential is amazing. And we've been working really hard on it. And the giant goal, everybody we're working with, it's, it's usually collaborative and Everybody wants to find ways to open source it. And there's a lot of cool IP in here that could, you know, make a lot of people, and, and probably will, even if we open source it. But it's really, um, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing stuff across, just really like across disciplines in a sourcing way that's really neat. It's, it's really, and, and starting as the tools get better, the collaborative opportunities get better. Because People love to collaborate, right? It's how do you, you know, just you, you want to do it. Figuring out the financials is often tricky, but most people really want to do it. And most people in the science and tech, you know, we're in a, I'm in it because I want to decode flow and I want to develop the best flow training in the history of the universe, right? Like that's my game. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, I'd like me and my people to get paid along the way because we, <laughs> we got it. We got to eat like everybody else. Um, but that, you know what I mean? So like, that's how we want to play. That's how everybody I know wants to play It's So it's really, it's a fun time to get to do this work. Um, though the structures for it, you know, we have to reinvent as we go along, which we make that point in future, especially if you think we're entering an, a, a world of business model reinvention, which mm. sounds like such a like business model reinvention. Like, what's <laughs> the big deal? Right. It's a big deal. Like, so, and, and, it, and it's, and it's rapid. So like in the 20th century, we got like one new business model a decade. So in the, in the, in the fifties, we got franchise models, McDonald's shows up and suddenly franchise models work, right. Changes the world. In the sixties, it was big box stores. Walmart changes the world. Once the internet shows up, we got about six or seven new business models. Nobody had ever seen before data sharing models. You give me your data, I give you free stuff. Nobody had ever done that before. Brand new business models. 
we are entering an era where there are like 11 new business models that are going to unfold over the next decade. Really incredibly viable business models um, that we've never seen before. A business model is nothing more than a tool for collaboration and a way mm. to generate value, right? That's what it is. And so we're in and, and the open source stuff we're talking about, right? we're now moving into second and third generation open source stuff. Like I remember when we were writing about like the early days at Wired of, oh my God, there's this open source revolution, crowdfunding. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I, I have, I have the, uh, I have the proposal. I don't even know if I should have this great proposal for Jeff Howe's book on crowdfunding. He was the Wired reporter who broke the crowdfunding story. And I've got like the proposal for his book. And it's like, there's this new thing going on in the world. It's <laughs> going to change everything. Right. And, and it, you, you, at that book, it was 15 years ago or so. You know what I mean? It, and now it we've was, had like four It was 20 years ago. It was on, on Kickstarter. Being raised. Well, I mean, but I mean, that's forget crowdfunding. I mean, crowdfunding ICOs. Mm -hmm. We talk about that yeah. at Futures Fest. And you think there is never, you know, one of the reasons the future is speeding up is because the rate of innovation is speeding up. One of the rate of reason it's speeding up is there's never much money flowing into technology ever. And yeah. ICOs, right? Like blockchain backed crowdfunding essentially has proved to be the fastest capital raising vehicle in the history of the world. And it like the numbers just bought $150 billion in a month, you know, $30 million in 10 seconds. Like you look at the numbers and you're like, this, they were drunk, right? Like, they were, they were <laughs> drunk. No, like that's not real. Like yeah. they missed a comma or something and it, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's, it's right and left. So it's, you know, I don't know. It's an exciting time. It is really exciting. So one of the things that, you know, uh, just to ground some of this in, like there is so much change coming in. And with each of these exponential technologies, I think one of the points that the book really brought home for me, which I never really stopped to consider, which was surprising uh, considering my background as an engineer, was how much just the innovation from horses to cars, right, which was a while ago, um, we sat back and how much that changed society, just the, the blueprint of how we look at society functionally, right? Like we went from horse and cart to car, but then we also had to develop car parks, we had to develop roads, all these arterial networks that we kind of see, right, um, to facilitate the car, right? But all of a sudden, if we start moving through something like, okay, there's no more cars on the road or you, like owning a car is purely a hobbyist thing, um, yeah, it changes so, the landscape in which we live in in such a... So transportation is great. So let, let's talk about that for half a second. Line cars, which I just mentioned, that's just one element. You just mentioned it, autonomous vehicles, right? Yeah. Every major car company is rolling out autonomous vehicles this year. We've got Waymo, right? Google's autonomous car division. They want to be doing a million autonomous taxi rides a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, coronavirus is going to speed that up because you're alone in the taxi. At, right. And they can sterilize yeah. it between uses and blah, 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 right? Like it, so that's coming even faster. We've got Hyperloop. These are high speed trains that do 750 miles an hour. It's Las Vegas to Los Angeles in 20 minutes. And there are 25 Hyperloop projects in the world today, uh -huh. right? Stretching from India, you know, to like Pittsburgh, right? Like everywhere there, Elon Musk has this boring company. He's drilling tunnels under major cities to build high-speed conveyor belts. And then he said he's, his rockets, they're taking satellites into space right now and want, to, want going to take people to Mars in the 2030s. And he's dead sent on that, man, by the way. Like, that's going to happen, and, um, which is a all other story. But he said recently and has pursued this, that his rockets, by the end of the decade, can do London to Shanghai in 39 minutes. Mm. And he thinks they could be used for terrestrial transport as well. And the point is what you were talking about, the horse and buggy revolution, that's one tra tra technology transition, right? One. We've yeah. got five showing up in a decade. And to put to drive home the point you made, very foundational things go away. So do you need car insurance if you don't own a car? Google automatically insures you if you get into a Waymo autonomous taxi. You're all insured by them. So the risk profile totally shifts. So personal auto insurance, 
may go away because individual car ownership may go away because we're moving to car as a service, car on demand rather than car as a thing we own. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. But really foundational things change. So flying cars, for example, can do 150 miles an hour on average. If you want to qualify for Uber's program, it's 150 miles an hour and three hours of continuous flight cable transporting four passengers plus a pilot. Um, even though they'll be autonomous, they'll probably have pilots in them for backup, at least in the beginning. So if all that's possible, how, where do you live? What's the real estate market like if you can now live three hours from, you know what I mean? Like or three, 150 miles from your office and do the same commute or what's the size of the local school district if you can go las vegas to los angeles in 20 minutes what's the size of the local dating pool right mm -hmm. people in brooklyn date people in new york all the in manhattan all the time it's a 20 minute train ride so if i live in la and i can get to las vegas in 25 minutes does that mean i right really foundational things right <gasps> tinder right like Swipe right if you're a hyperloop <laughs> away. I mean, like, what, right? I mean, like, yeah. it's a much bigger, like, hookup pool mm -hmm. if that's your thing, right? I mean, like, really basic things shift in really foundational ways. And it's not, of course, just transportation. Um, healthcare is probably, um, uh, before I run out of time and got to run away, um, we should probably talk about what's coming in That's healthcare because yeah. it's good, it's yeah. relevant and it and it's great. Um, it's um so it, on on the front end we're seeing two radical. So if you look at healthcare, let's call it a medical treatment train, right? Mm. And we're seeing every step in the train massively reinvented. On the front end of that train, you've got diagnostics. Mm -hmm. We are seeing a revolution in AI red diagnostics. We see AI diagnosing cancer better than doctors, reading radiological screens better than doctors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's only going to spread more and more, right? We are also seeing all kinds of new sensors. David Sinclair, Harvard geneticist, was just on a podcast with Peter, my co-author, mm -hmm talking about his company is just one of a myriad of companies that are developing, and they're real, this is real right now, global real-time pathogen and virus detection sensors that detect anything in the air, that's strange, they automatically sequence its RNA and its DNA, and soon, if it signs anything weird, that message is gonna be sent to antiviral production facilities, and we're gonna, start producing viruses, producing antigens automatically. Like that's, this is where we are now in terms of the detection. That's wow. what's coming very soon. Um, so on the front end from everything, and sensors are incredible right now. Like Tricorder X Prize was won a couple of years ago. This is a, a handheld device the size of your cell phone um, that can diagnose 50 of the major illnesses in the world better than a board certified doctor. That's first generation. Second generation is coming to your cell phone in the next three years. Your cell phone is becoming a top shelf medical device at a level like nothing we've ever seen. So they have biosensors looking for viruses everywhere and pathogens everywhere globally. We're also going to have real time monitoring of our own bio health with a device that's connected to a diagnostic AI in the cloud, this is all happening now. This isn't high in the sky. This is all right here, right now. And that's just the front end. The middle, we've got robot surgeons taking over the operating room, right? Like surgeries are a major medical procedure. Um, other than that, there's nerve care and things, a hospital care. So we've got robots doing all of those jobs and these are emotionally aware robots that can bond with patients and so there's that kind of care that i had hernia surgery a couple of years ago it was performed by a da vinci robot that's so it's all cardiac surgery hernia surgery gallbladder surgery um my father just had he had he had the craziest surgery i can't even remember what it was i just blanked 
get it in an afternoon. It used to take three days. Like he told me I was terrified. Wow. He's like, oh no, it's outpatient. And I was like, what? <laughs> I lost my mind. He's 80. And I was like in and out in a day. And I was like, what? Anyways, um, but here's the really cool news. This is not just lifestyles of the rich and famous. Google Alphabet, actually, their parent company teamed up with uh, Johnson & Johnson. They released Verb Surgical this year. It's democratized cheap global surgical robots. And you talked earlier about the 60s, the growth cycle of an exponential, how it gets digital, then it becomes deceptive, it goes away, and then it gets disruptive. And then it, you know, one of the things that happens next is democratizes, it goes global, and it demonetizes, it becomes really cheap, mm -hmm. right? So what's happened that we saw with smartphones, right, that sort of stuff. And it's now happening with surgical robots. This stuff is going wide. And on the back end of the treatment train, and we're seeing this in real time, there are now 40 different COVID-19 vaccines and drugs being tested worldwide. It's a, a record, right? Why? Because genomics can now sequence RNA and DNA in hours. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening because AI can do drug discovery. It used to take a decade. Now it takes literally minutes to hours. Mm -hmm. There's a company we write about in the book called in silico medicine they're in baltimore they use they basically pit two ais against each other and you can talk to them and you say okay look i need to find a drug it doesn't have any side effects in humans it treats respiratory tract infections blah 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 blah. works on the calcium channel i blah, blah all that stuff as specific as you want and these two ais go to battle and compete to see who has the best solution to the problem and using it they're doing drug discovery that used to take years mm -hmm. in minutes and weeks. And the cool thing about AI, because the system learns and grows and learns and grows at an exponential rate. So I like, you know, COVID-19 is the very first time in history we're really seeing an exponential problem being attacked by exponential solutions. Mm -hmm. That's never happened before. Two things have never happened before right now. We've never had the entire world in a you know, million years of our history. We have never been united against a common enemy before. Mm. And for the first time in history, we were fighting an exponential problem, a global problem with exponential solutions. And it's astounding and we're seeing it in real time, but it's also the tip of the iceberg and where it gets amazing because there's the back end of the thing is, well, who cares if you can discover the drugs in 40 days if you still got to test them in humans? Mm. And that is true, but what we are slowly gaining the capability to do, and probably will have it by the end of the decade, is simulate all of human biology inside a computer. And when we can simulate all of human biology in a computer, we can drug test in computers. And yep, that's instead of the wet labs. Right, yeah, yeah, right yeah, so yeah, the wet yeah, labs, yeah. we can do it in silico. So literally, um, it's funny, and, and, and nobody wants to sort of, say this right now, but I've heard a lot of people in the singularity community kind of talk about this, and I think it's really clear, which is like, in a weird way, our current medical crisis is sort of low-hanging fruit for converging technologies. Both AI and quantum are really good at solving the, it's just, it's a weird thing, like there are, her, climate change is an exponential problem that there isn't this much like we're not this mm. far along but yeah. um and there are you know if we were dealing with global ebola that might be a very different story that's we're not there yet but covid 19 is the kind of thing that we are actually like sort of prepared to handle globally and you're mm. seeing with all the, their 3d printing everything from hospitals to quarantine rooms to ventilators to respirators and yeah. we didn't know how to do any of this stuff three <laughs> weeks ago Right, or two weeks ago. And so, I mean, we're printing hospitals. The Chinese, the day after the, there were no viruses found in China, they printed a, a, store, a cashierless store, grocery store, a cashierless grocery store in a day. Printed, stocked, <laughs> open in a day. It, like they opened a stateway. <laughs> It was like from scratch, it didn't exist. And then the next day they had a grocery store and there were no cashiers. So there was no, and it was stocked by robots. Wow. And everything was, I mean, so it's a, 
it's a, the, the, the issues are so real right now and they're not like, this is not to mitigate the, the, the suffering and the fear and the issues and what we're up against, but paying attention to what's going on. And, it, and you mentioned it. I just want to say this is because it's scientists. I, you probably know this, but if you've ever you've been inside of science, I always say, if you want to see what competition is, forget like the NFL and rugby and, you know, go to a science convention, like go to a neuroscience convention. I used to, the roughest thing I've ever seen in my life is I used to go to this high performance conference at the Santa Fe Institute every summer. And it was like everybody in the high performance space from like guys like Anders Ericsson doing psychological research to like the folks who work on the San Antonio Spurs to complexity scientists, me, Navy SEALs, this huge assortment. And it's like, it's a full contact sport. Up next year, I'm bringing boxing. <laughs> I've never seen any, I've never seen anything. And that's just science, right? That's how scientists are. And the craziest thing in the world is right now, everybody in the world is sharing data. Everybody in the world is collaborating. There are more experiments going on in the world right now on a single problem than ever before in history. And it's the, the open source possibilities, because I always say, once you get a taste of cooperation, it's really hard to go back to competition. Love that. Uh, Love it, it really is. I mean, like competition can be fun and I'm competitive as hell, mm -hmm. right? But I'm mostly competitive as hell with myself because that's the most fun and mm -hmm. I'm cooperative with the world if I can be because that's mm -hmm. also the most fun. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. One of the questions I was going to ask you with technology changing so rapidly and the cutting edge companies in early 2018 at the start of writing the book um, were edged out by late 2019. Um, you know, yeah, just I was going to see like what was, you know, most surprising to you in the short time since you've written the book and it's launched and what's happened, but we've kind of just covered that. I think the question that comes up for me secondary to that question is, you know, there's, and this is a bit more of a, I guess, ethos or moral kind of question, but the conversation around legacy, when things are changing so fast and so rapidly, is that a conversation that is like, what is the legacy of a company? What is the legacy that they leave behind when they're so quickly like able to be superseded and moved out? You know? mm. I, so that is, a, uh, that is an awesome question, I think. And it is not one um, I've actually, it's not a discussion I haven't, Right, like I haven't had it, um, but it's a, it is a really interesting problem. You go back to the 1920s, average corporate lifespan was 67 years. I mm. think that was up into the 40s or 50s. Today, it's, it's less than 14, which is you know insane. 40% of the for world's Fortune 500 companies are gonna be gone over the next 10 years, right? Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's an astounding amount of turnover. Um, simultaneously, there are also really interesting studies of like phenomenally long lived companies, companies that have been around 500 years, 700 years, like really, right. There's work that's been done there as well. So we actually know kind of what preserves companies for really long, long, long time, or at least have some ideas. Um, but it's an interesting question. And you know, Jeff Bezos said uh, to his shareholders in an address, and I'm going to get, I'm going to screw this up, but afraid of something, to the, <laughs> you know, something to the extent of, I am pretty certain that Amazon is going to be out of business within 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. I remember this. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, that's an astounding thing, right? To say to your, to say to your, to say to your board, I think that's really True, but I also think that, so the question of legacy is interesting because companies may have, it, 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 I would say it's the legacy is, is now it's, it's gonna be, I don't even wanna say it's individuals, but it's, cause everybody I know, like one of the things that I've been studying a lot in peak performance is this question of multiple acts. I, I got interested in the question of what I call long-term creativity, which is not what does it take to be super creative in the moment or for this project or for that project, but what does it take to maintain high creativity over an entire career? And I've been studying that for four or five years. I write a little bit uh, in a, about it in a book that I have coming out next year called The Art of Impossible, but it's a real passion of mine. So I've been looking at individuals who have reinvented themselves five, six, seven, eight times. 
I'm also looking at individuals who have maintained one career over 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. Mm. What, are the, what does that take? How does that work? How do you continue to be creative? How do you have careers like uh, in music, you can look at a David Byrne or a David Bowie um, or a guy like Dre who has just like reinvented and reinvented and reinvented themselves. Oh, Neil Young was one of the classic examples from that era, right? Like over and over and over again, why is he doing a rockabilly album? I remember from like my, my teenage years, he's doing a rockabilly album because that's innovation, right? Like um, kind of thing. So like, what does that take? How does that work? And the reason I'm saying all this to answer your question is, I'm not so sure companies are gonna last that long anymore a company may become a vehicle for an i which is what it really is it's a vehicle for an idea right mm -hmm. it's a it's a way of generating value right now we have rather rough ways for companies to end mm -hmm. right and it can be very aggressive it could be really weird there are there could be a lot of innovation on that right there can be in how do you morph from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing how do you build companies that are like complex adaptive systems mm. rather, right? Like those kinds of questions. And those are real questions that, that, that smart people are, are poking at hard. Um, uh, but those are, those are, you know, sort of the, the, the ways you want to, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't think about legacy as, you know, I, you know, I like I've been involved in or helped start 20 some companies, right? Like, 2021 20, between magazines and companies that I've been involved in. Um, and I, I don't even have a particularly entrepreneurial, you know, you know what I mean? Like there are, I know, I know are, are much bigger. Um, that's like, what's that legacy, right? Like Branson's legacy is what exactly? Cause there's 400 companies there. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, which, so, so you know what I mean? Some it's, of it comes back to the individual and what is the values that they're. At, at, but I also think that, I think there's a flip, like there's a point there that I think is worth exploring. I'm not going to do it here, but like, I like the idea of how do you kind of melt the company and birth it into something new that seamlessly, right? Mm -hmm. So you can preserve what needs to be preserved, et cetera, yes, et cetera. Yes. Those yeah. are really interesting questions. Love it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So one of the questions I've got is kind of leaning into taking that place is, you know, the anxiety that you've sometimes labeled as 20th century normal, right? Um, in terms of, you know, there's this, there's this baseline anxiety that we feel just because of being in a, in a seemingly hyper-connected world to a certain degree, but then also that has, you know, these receptors we're basically playing on dopamine all the time and we're having to navigate that on a consistent basis and a, a myriad of reasons, right? Like the challenges of just how uh, evolved the society is based on just the linear progression our mind actually went through in its biological developments um, over the past and now just the exponential growth that we're interfacing. How do you anticipate, how do you anticipate that baseline normal to evolve as convergent exponential the convergence of exponentiality um, evolves around us in the world that you know we're in how do we how does our biology and us kind of like how do we navigate that from like a psychological yeah i guess i'm drawing on some of the context around flow there as well yeah it's a, it, i think it's a it's a great question in general it's a really relevant question today mm. There are two things going on in the world today. We've got two epidemics. We've got an epidemic of fear and we've got an epidemic disease, right? Like we've got a pandemic and we've, we've got two pandemics, yeah. one's of fear and one disease. And the reasons you were alluded, like we are in the world today, we have local and linear brains. They evolved in an area where the rate of change was really slow. Everything we dealt with was a day's walk away. We live in a global and exponential world. Our brain literally cannot process exponential change. We have a linear bias. So when you encounter something like a map of a virus growing exponentially, your brain literally goes, it doesn't understand it. It can't process it. Yeah. It treats it as a total unknown. And whenever there's a total, like that kind of uncertainty, what do you get? Hypervigilance, norepinephrine, cortisol, a huge spike in fear. Worse, the danger evolved in an era of immediacy, right? Threat is a tiger in the bush. I got to fight it right now. I got to run away right now. We live in an era of probabilistic dangers. The economy might nosedive. COVID-19 could become much worse, right? These are 
maybes. Mm. The brain doesn't know how to deal with a maybe. It knows how to deal with on and off. It's not mm. designed to stop signaling threat, threat, threat until a danger is gone completely. Probabilistic dangers are never gone completely. We got a really great look at this in after 9-11. Terrorists might attack as a probabilistic danger. We had to learn to live with a probabilistic danger as a, a, here in America in a way we had never had to do it before. A whole nation had to learn how to do that. Now mm -hmm. the whole globe is getting, uh, you know, getting the same experience. Um, the problem is that the brain doesn't, it's not adapted to this. We have not had a hardware upgrade, upgrade in a couple hundred thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah. right, that, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean we're helpless and there are, we just did last week at the Flow Research Collective, uh, and we've been doing this every Thursday night, uh, a free live event, get to get online webcast, I guess, um, with myself and all my psychologists and, and neuroscientists and the whole, the whole big team. Um, working together and we were talking about like literally peak performance in a time of pandemics and uh, What I talked about was a little bit of what I just told you and I said look We're very positive psychology. This isn't even advanced flow stuff. This is just simple basic positive psychology I'm not telling you anything we don't know but positive psychology has been look at looking at this problem for a very long time And they've got very good solutions. There's three of them and I always say these are the positive psychology basics Gratitude practice, mindfulness practice, exercise. Mm. And I, you know, I could go into details of why and we could talk for a while about the science behind it. But the truth of the matter is five minutes of gratitude practice a day, 11 to 22 minutes of mindfulness or respiration and 20 to 40 minutes of exercise or exercise until it's quiet upstairs. All three things simply reset the nervous system. They're the only way you can shut off a hypervigilant response to exponential threats. It's the, you ha and the truth of the matter is, under normal conditions, at the Flow Genome Pro uh, Flow Research Collective, sorry, old company, at the yeah. Flow Research Collective, um, we say pick one, do one a day, right? Mm -hmm. Five minutes of gratitude, 11 to 22, 11 to 20 of respiration mindfulness, or 20 to 40 of exercise. So equally work well. Now, today, in today, like where we are right now, uh, do all three. Stack. <laughs> like, Get the stack. stack. Yeah. <laughs> do all two, like do all three. I've been doing all three, right? Like do all three um, for sure. And there's also the like, on, on top of that, there's also what I, I always say, there's, there's two levels to the peak performance basics, actually. There's, there's, there's this positive psychology basics. That's the cognitive side. And then there's a physical side, which is get a good night's sleep. Hmm. hydration, nutrition, and social support, right? We like, we can have physical distancing, but we need social support hmm. in general, right? And the, and, and during a time of crisis, that's how you reset your nervous system. And you, and you have to understand that like peak performance from a scientific point of view, after 30 years of studying this stuff, I can tell you 98% of it is the same thing. It is figuring out how do I get my biology to work for me rather than against me. That's mm. all we're doing here. And if you get your biology, flow is your biology working for you. Mm. What happens in flow? Motivation and productivity amplify 500%. Creativity goes up 600%. Learning 300%. Collaboration, cooperation, empathy, environmental awareness, meaning, purpose. Like the, it's a big stack, right? Mm. All of them skyrocket. When you get your biology working for you rather than against you, we do amazing. Like we're built to perform at our best mm -hmm. and the acceleration is profound if you get it right. So those are the peak performance basics. And I think those are non-negotiables right now. And the last thing I wanna say, which is about flow, yes, peak performance in a, in, in a time of pandemics is, is, is more than possible. Um, I'm happy to give you a bunch of resources, places mm -hmm. to go if you go to, the flow research. If you go to zero to danger.com, you can schedule a free peak performance consult with one of my coaches. If you go to flowresearchcollective.com forward slash flow blocker, there's a free flow diagnostic. It'll analyze your life and say, this is the thing that is standing in the way of more flow in your oh, life. Amazing. And more importantly, we like to talk about 
primary flow activities and secondary flow activities. Right. People usually have a main flow activity and a secondary flow activity. Main flow activity is usually that thing you did as a kid that just made you, right? For me, it's skiing. It's 90% of the time I go skiing, I'm in a flow state. Hmm. Writing is my secondary activity. 60, 70% of the time when I sit down to write, I'm in a flow state, right? So I, I often think it's better to work in your secondary than in your primary because you don't want to mess with the, the primary flow. But everybody has their primary kind of flow activity, whether it's dancing or playing video games or yeah, for me, it's conversation. Yeah, yeah. Conversation, <laughs> interpersonal flow, conversation, all, whatever it is. And so here's the final thing I want to say. Now is the time to figure out how to do it alone and double down on your primary flow activity. And the reason is, besides the positive psychology basics, a couple of things are really critical. One, when we move into flow, all of the stress hormones rush from our system. It resets the nervous system at zero. So the fastest way we can get out of hypervigilant and back to normal is flow. Now you have to be doing the positive psychology basics at some level, because if you're full scale panic, too much norepinephrine in the system, it'll block flow. But if you've been doing that stuff and double down on your so primary primed. flow activity. So A, B, all the neurochemicals that show up in flow massively amplify the immune system. So it's a huge in resilience. And this is not my work. It's primarily Herb Benson at Harvard, but uh, we've done some work there as well, but huge boost in resilience. Three, flow is a focusing skill. It's training the brain to focus in a very particular way. And it turns out the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So when I get into a ton of flow skiing, it helps me get into a ton of flow writing. Even better, the heightened creativity that shows up in a flow state and depending on the numbers you go by, we've done a bunch of work. We've got 400 to 700% boosts in creativity. That's been backed up by work done that was at the University of Sydney. And, but the cool thing is Harvard, Teresa Amabil, I always kill her last name. I can't get it right. I can't even pronounce it. Amabile is what I always say that's not right. And Amabile, I think it's close. Anyways. Brilliant, actual, brilliant business researcher and creativity researcher. She found that the heightened creativity that shows up in flow will outlast a flow state by a day, sometimes two. So mm. if you double down on your primary flow activity and then you go back to work, that boost in creativity is Thanks coming sure. with you. Yo. And yeah, and the other thing that's really important to know is the more norepinephrine in your system, the less creative you get. It actually makes us very logical, very linear, because when you're facing a big problem, the brain wants to simplify. The extreme example is fight or flight, right? This is so bad, you've got two options. Well, trust, it's a scale. It's a scale of bad, right? So like the more norepinephrine, the fewer options. The fewer options, the less creativity, the less divergent thinking, the less innovation, the less breakthrough, the less opportunity, it spirals. So. Mm -hmm. If you're doing nothing else for peak performance over this next period, especially when we're stuck at home, this is the best time. So our, our chief scientist, Connor Murphy, in our, in our recent podcast pointed out, I didn't know this, but uh, it totally made it really good sense from learning theory perspective. Times of crisis are phenomenal for habit formation. During times of crisis, we can build new habits faster than ever before. Crazy. But um, the neurobiology actually makes sense. So we're in the middle of a crisis. Double down on the peak performance basics. We all know this stuff. Um, there's lots of science about why it works and how it works and all that stuff. Double yeah. down. Yeah. Set up a peak performance protocol. Double down on flow, on your primary flow activity. You'll be grooving your brain, training it out again to flow. You're boosting your immune system. You're lowering your stress levels and you're getting more creative. And it's a great time. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do and you can get all fancy with this. Mm. Sure. But like, it's a great time to start there, I think. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing the basics with us. And that is like, and diving deep into the, the I guess, the, the surgery behind it almost. But the thing that is coming forward to me from that is just the impetus in terms of 
looking after ourselves to prep ourselves from like an internal space as well right in terms of the world that's coming um outside as well so that we aren't consistently jacked and wired in that you know flight or flight response considering that the world is and, and then by the way let's let's i i said that there, i'm seeing an epidemic of fear I actually think I'm seeing a third epidemic and, and, and I, I have to, I have to go. This is the last thing I will say. I am seeing an epidemic of cooperation in a level I've never seen before, right? We are literally the entire world has decided to come together to protect the old, the weak and the sick. Has mm -hmm. that ever happened before? Holy crap. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing neighborhoods all over the world. People keep sending me photos of signs that say, Hey, need food need groceries, need care. I'm your neighbor. I'm here to help. Text this number everywhere. It's that's, that's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And it's more and more minute by minute. So I got to jump. This has been kind of an amazing <laughs> time with you. Um, it was fun, fun to hang out with you. Um, but I got to, I have to jump into my next, next Always thing I've heard. 20 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time and energy. Just want to thank you again. Thank you for writing the incredible book. For those that want to tune in, it'll be in the show notes. The future is faster than you think. And uh, brother, always, always a pleasure just to have you on. Hey, it's so it's good to see you. So Real good pleasure. to talk to you. Thanks, brother. Have a beautiful day. Ciao. You too. Bye. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Love of the Inspired Evolution and sharing the Love of the Inspired Evolution. If you feel like this content may support, has supported you or may support anyone else that you know may resonate with the content of it, please share away and share the love around. Thank you guys so much. And to stay up to date on whatever's coming out with the Inspired Evolution, please subscribe. There's all these links in the bio for you to tune into the episodes and all these different platforms just so that message can get to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Stay inspired to evolve.